Welcome to this uh, webinar on the role of the science and technology community on the pillars for accelerating progress and transformative actions on uh, Sustainable Development Goals 6. Uh, distinguished speakers, Dr. Ignacio Gonzalez Castellao, Chair of the WFO Committee on Water, Dr. Marlene Kanga, WFO Past President and Sydney, Sydney Water Non-Executive Director, Dr. Tom So, Executive Director of International Association for Hydro-Environmental Engineering and Research, and Mrs. Sharia Shakraborty, Researcher on the International Water Management Institute, New Delhi, India. Dear participants, ladies and gentlemen, good morning, good afternoon, good, good evening, all, all of you. And, and welcome, welcome to this very interesting, interesting uh, webinar. I, I am delighted, delighted as the president, the president of WFO, the World Federation of Engineering Organizations, to have the opportunity of opening this webinar, which has held uh, in the framework of the 2023 United Nations Water Conference. I want to thank the International Science Council that co-organizes with us the Scientific and Technological Measure Group of the United Nations Economic and Social Council. WFO has committed itself to mobilizing the global engineering community towards accelerating the delivery of the United Nations Sustainable Development. Milestones in this strategy include key participant uh, partnerships with UNESCO, especially the UNESCO first and second engineering reports, published in 2011 and 2021, the WFO-UNESCO Paris Declaration on Advancing the United Nations SDGs through engineering, and the proclamation of the UNESCO World Engineering Day for Sustainable Development that we celebrate each 4th March from 2020. The daily work of WFO is mainly conducted through its standing technical committees and policy implementation committees, which are required to focus on particular SDGs and report and publish on how those goals can be achieved through engineering or how engineers contribute to progress. In 2018, WFO established a working group on water, which is hosted by the Federation's uh, national institution representing Spain and Portugal. Under the leadership of its chairs, Tomás Sancho, the group has already achieved a considerable amount of work that includes reports on United Nations water conferences, a white paper on delivering SDG 6 through engineering, a report on the best practices of drought and flood management, and participation in various webinars and uh, on water reuse, sanitation, climate change adaptation, and so on. In 2022, WFO General Assembly acknowledged the quality of this work by establishing the group as a standing technical committee under the chairmanship of Ignacio Gonzalez Castellao. This aims to provide a strong platform to coordinate the engineering water work around the world, and so WFO will be able to make a significant contribution to accelerate the delivery of SDG 6. In 2020, 74% of global population had access to safely managed drinking water services, up, to, up from uh, 70 in 2015, and 54% of the global population had access to safely managed sanitation services up from 47 in 2015. Today, some 2 billion people are living in countries experiencing, experiencing high water stress and innovative engineering solutions for access and sanitation are urgently needed. Adapting the, to climate change is making the challenge even more difficult. 
Global institutions and governments must cooperate to accelerate the capacity building through STEM and encourage young people, special girls to become engineers and study hydrology to make a significant difference in improving the life quality of their community. WFO also mobilizes resources to take part in joint projects led by NGOs in partnerships with UNESCO to fund hydrological training sessions for a dozen African countries in order to support local NGOs projects related to water access and sanitation, as well as water basic education. Engineers are needed to design and operate dams and reservoirs channels, pipelines, water treatment plants, and also for planning and managing water resources. We want to promote the emerging natural-based engineering solutions to improve rivers, underground aquifers, and urban drainage management. We also want to accelerate the technological de development of safe wastewater reuse, desalination, and new irrigation technologies for agriculture pressing needs. More engineers are also needed to contribute to disaster risk assessment and management to help prepare for floods and droughts to reduce economic losses from natural disasters. <laughs> An important step is acknowledging the growing challenges of what scarcity is uh, the launch of the water action decade for the 2018-2028 period to mobilize actions that will help transform how we manage water. Engineers must be deeply involved in this process to turn words into action, strategy into effective projects, and division into field initiatives. SDG 6 can only be achieved with the help of technology and by building partnerships at global and local levels. Civil society has the most important role to play here. Through our membership, we are linking the scales of United Nations agencies and local projects. We aim as well to articulate the targets of SDG 6 with the relevant stakeholders in field and with the right skills and technologies. The whole point here is mobilizing to leave no one behind. We hope that you will help us to spread our vision and expectations, and I wish you a fruitful webinar. Thank you very much for your attention. Um, thank, thank you very much, uh, Jose. Let me share the screen first. Well, uh, good afternoon for those who don't know the purpose of this conference that is taking place these days at the United Nations. Just let me say that the objective, its objective is the midterm comprehensive review of the implementation of the objectives of the International Decade for Action. And also, in addition, the Agenda 2030 as the former initiative is an enabler of the Agenda 2030. The outcome of this conference, the Water Action Agenda, which will be materialized through various commitments, pledges, and actions. These initiatives will accelerate progress in the second half of the Water De Action Decade, SDG 6, and the other water ready goals and targets. Therefore, the Water Action Agenda is an accelerator and is closely linked to the SDG 6 Global Accelerator Framework a unified initiative that is also part of the International Decade for Action and involves all sectors of society to accelerate progress by improving support to countries. Science and engineering are present both in the work themes of the objectives of the decade and in the topics of the five interact dialogues of this week's UN conference. For these sessions, we want to focus of the science and engineering on the themes of the last dialogue of water action decades, and more specifically, on the role played by scientific and engineering institutions in the third action pillar of the SDGs Global Acceleration Framework, which is, which is accelerated. This pillar consists of five accelerators that are expected to radically improve the international community. These are finance and data and information, capacity development, 
innovation, and governance. Also, there are five, three of them could be grouped in what is known as knowledge. And I will refer to this in this presentation, understanding knowledge as not only scientific, but also local, indigenous, and community services. Engineering collects and materializes all this type of knowledge, placing them at the service of society and the environment. The Agenda 2030 SDGs are based on findings from the natural and social science and other fields regarding the implementation of necessary changes to ensure the survival and prosperity of all people and all forms of life on the planet. Without dismissing the, the importance of good governance and financing, which are essential for reaching these targets, it is important to recognize that engineering and the institutions that represent it make an equal valuable contribution to the implementation of these necessary changes and the three accelerator mentioned before. However, however, we also need more engineers present in these two pillars. Even for UNESCO had an engineering initiative addressing engineering education for sustainable development, the role of engineering disciplines has not been perceived as central to achievement of the SDGs among other disciplines in social science and humanities not even in the SDG 6. <clears throat> Engineering education has changed a lot in a short period. To address SDG 6 goals and targets, engineers have spent their thinking beyond strictly technical solutions, focusing more on environmental and social aspects, such as do not significant harm principle, gender-sensitive planning, human rights-based approach, and leaving no one behind them or others. Facing present and future, what are the challenges? Engineers' capacity today goes far beyond traditional solutions, providing the best response, gray, green, or blue, to each specific case, with particular attention to sustainability, circularity, and resilience of water resources. Thus, contributing, contributing to a sustainable, intelligent, and inclusive development. An example of this is the UBCO Committee on Education and Engineering. All this has significantly changed the education and mentality of new engineers. We cannot forget that there is an important link between country's engineering capacity and its economic development. Water engineering is a multidisciplinary profession involving the combined skills and cooperation of many subdisciplines of engineering, as well you can see on the slide, such as civil, environmental, mechanical, chemical, agricultural, electrical, and electronic engineers, among others. Regarding the first accelerator of this DG6 global accelerator framework, there are inherent data and information gaps for this making. The best example of this is close at hand, the chronic and consistent lack of data on almost all water SDG6 indicators. Given that water resources are becoming less predictable, the knowledge, science, and data that have been generated and used in the past need to be revisited to better equip society with knowledge and move from policy to action to meet future water challenges. Engineering and engineering institutions, as independent bodies, can identify and prioritize the most relevant areas of water related opportunities where the need for data is key to decision making. Also, to make note that and share the technical capacity for data acquisition, digitalization, and treatment systems for water management and risk. Also, assisting data disaggregation consistently and reliable to achieve greater democratization, transparency, and access to data and information. This is critical to understanding water-related challenges and opportunities that promote the specific policies to address water issues and achieve equitable distribution of water resources, a necessary step to leave no one behind. All these data serve, among other things, to know the status of existing water infrastructure, which are essential to design water-related action plans. For this reason, many engineering organizations prepare infrastructure report cards at national or state level. The UFU Working Group on Infrastructure Report Card is promoting the dissemination of a methodology to, write, to carry out these studies. Engineers should also effectively and clearly communicate the information produced by the data to politicians and government officials to ensure that the decision making is data driven. Therefore, we strongly support the inter inter interactive dialogue initiative presented in concept paper five regarding the creation of a panel of experts independent of governments to make the challenge of water and other sectors visible. The accelerator on capacity development requires enable conditions to support and align the capacity needs for the, the demands with the demands. 
no SDG 6 targets or other water goals and targets can be achieved without a sufficient trained workforce. There is a need to strengthen capacity development like never before. Not only is there a professional gap or breach in water and sanitation, but it's one that is growing. The world needs to be equipped with skilled professionals at all levels to address current problems and future demands. Education and labor needs to align to attract, educate, train, and retain qualified professionals, especially women, as demands change over time. Engineering institutions can contribute significantly to capacity building support by sharing and providing access to water related knowledge and exchange the good practices. Engineering partnerships can serve you as reinforcement of communication actions for implementation of the water related SDGs and collaborate collaborating with the SDG 6 capacity development initiatives. Professional institutions are the most natural way to disseminate new young water concepts and initiatives and raise awareness of water resilience, resilience importance. Related to this, let me point out that UFO has the Committee on Engineering Capacity Building, and we also count on the WFEO Academy Initiative. Therefore, we strongly support the interactive dialogue of an in initiative that was presented in the concept paper five on capacity development for a global multi-stakeholder alliance of organizations from water, sanitation, agriculture, health, education, labor, and economic development. Traditionally, society has advanced after technolo technological innovations, but today, as with climate change, changes are happening first, and mitigation and adaptation technology is lagging behind. Therefore, we need disruptive changes if you want to achieve not only SDG targets, but also carbon neutrality and water circularity, efficiency, and resilience. For this, the last accelerator innovation is critical in water issues and water food energy nexus. Professional engineering institutions are the vehicle for communicating new innovations, thus clo closing the gap between science, scientific development, and their practical implementations. Engineers integrate into projects water science-based solutions, technologies, and innovations. Often these solutions can be scalable and sometimes There are many water challenges, but we also need innovative low-cost solutions. The challenge will be for engineers to design and deliver affordable alternatives to low to mid-term income countries through innovative centralized and decentralized treatment technologies and alternative approaches to infrastructure development focus on not only in today, but also in tomorrow. In this context, I would like to call for adaptation. Most of the world's funding is devoted to innovation to innovative actions to mitigate climate change. Knowing that with the planet in mitigation measure, it's almost impossible to reach the temperature limit established in Paris Agreement, innovation in adaptation takes on an special relevance since beyond this, only forced migration remains. To conclude, I was, uh, I was just to say that engineering institutions are the one of the best support structures to assist where help is needed most and to move forward together towards sustainability, security, and resilience in the water worldwide. Also, if allowed, we can contribute to the technical solvency of the conclusion of the participatory stakeholder dialogues we can carry out these days in a year. Thank you very much, Jose, and the floor is yours. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Ignacio for your uh, very interesting uh, presentation. Now I will give the floor to Dr. Marlene Kanga. Marlene Kanga was uh, uh, WFU past president and now is Sydney Water, now executive director. Please, uh, Ma uh, Dr. Marlene, floor is yours. Uh, thank you, thank you very much, uh, 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 Professor Jose Vieira. It's a real pleasure to be here. And I welcome all speakers and participants. Uh, I'm speaking from Sydney, Australia. So good, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to you all. Uh, I'm just going to try and uh, share my screen. So I hope you can see my screen. Uh, I'm going to uh, present today uh, a case study on how uh, the SDG 6 uh, water is actually being advanced 
by Sydney Water Corporation, uh, the, uh, the largest water utility in Australia. And I'm going to focus on the uh, five accelerators that have been identified uh, uh, to, act, uh, to make this change and to advance the SDG goal six. So a little bit about myself. Marlene, uh, Marlene uh, I'm sorry. Uh, can you uh, share the, the screen, please? Okay. Um, sorry, I try again. Uh, yeah, I think, I yes, think now it yes, has come okay, up. No. Yeah. So, um, uh, so uh, sorry about that. So my, uh, uh, as uh, has been already mentioned, I'm a past president of the World Federation of Engineering Organizations, serving in this position from 2017 to 19. I'm a past president of Engineers Australia, and I'm a non-executive director of a number of large organizations in Australia um, that are in the utility sector, including Sydney Water Corporation, from 2017 to, uh, um, to, uh, to now. And I chaired a committee for the Board of Sydney Water on planning and infrastructure. So what I'm presenting here are my firsthand insights in leading the, uh, this organization in developing the future infrastructure for the city of Sydney. Uh, Professor Vieira has already spoken a little bit about WFEO. Uh, but you see here our member map and our global reach across the world, representing 100 professional engineering institutions and 30 million engineers. A key objective for the World Federation of Engineering Organizations is to advance the UN Sustainable Development Goals through engineering. Um, and of course, engineering is crucial to advancing the goals for water. SDG 6. Uh, the role of science and engineering, in fact, has been recognized by the UN Global Sustainable Development Report that was released in 2019, which identified science and engineering as one of four levers to accelerate sustainable development. And it also identified urban and peri-urban environments, or in other words, cities, as one of the six pathways that can accelerate transformation for sustainable development. And so the focus for me today in speaking about how one city has accelerated sustainable development for water is particularly important. And I hope that it provides a, a, a roadmap for other cities and other utilities to consider for advancing uh, this sustainable development goal six. My presentation is structured around the five accelerators that have been mentioned. And I'm going to speak about the role of, firstly, of government policy to support sustainable development aspirations, uh, the importance of governance and long-term planning for infrastructure to serve cities and to incorporate in, the, in that uh, strategies for sustainable development. The importance, of course, of innovation and new thinking and data and information to accelerators that are considered very important uh, for SDG 6. Training and capacity building for the workforce of the future. Fifthly, modeling the costs and benefits, which are broad social, economic, and environment for the people of the city. Financing for sustainable development projects. And most importantly, reporting on progress uh, using one of the available sustainability standards. And again, progress reporting is important for the data and information on SDG 6. So by way of background, uh, the government policy for the city of Sydney, which you see mapped here, um, uh, was uh, encapsulated in what was called the Greater Sydney Commission. And they produced a vision of a metropolis of three cities. So you see here in, in blue, uh, the Harbour City, which is the city that everyone around the world knows, the Harbour Bridge, the Sydney Opera House, and so forth. 
but the city has expanded west uh, to what's called Greater Parramatta around the Parramatta River. And there's further expansion happening in the next, in the future, in the next 15 to 20 years in, in what's now called Western Sydney um, and centered around the development of the second Sydney International Airport, which will commence operations in 2025 in just two years time. And this region in yellow uh, will soon accommodate more than one and a half million people in the next 15 years and 3 million in the next 30 years. And it will be one of the fastest growing uh, cities in the developed world. Um, so the Greater Sydney Commission had a vision for a sustainable city with maximum 30 minute travel time to education, work and leisure. But this poses some challenges because the distances are so vast. So from east to west, it's 100 kilometers. And from north to south, it's, uh, it's more than 100 kilometers. And across this large area, which is a basin surrounded by mountains, um, there is a, a significant difference in temperature, uh, which is three or four degrees warmer in the west, uh, less tree cover, only 16% compared with uh, the oldest harbor city of 32% and much less rainfall. So it is dry and hot in the West. So these, were some, these are some of the challenges that um, the this Greater Sydney Commission vision set out to address. They prepared a dashboard for sustainable development and tracking progress. So this just shows the government commitment to sustainable development. And the dashboard covers aspects that engineers are involved in, such as infrastructure, roads, housing, and of course, resilience to natural disasters, especially for this city, which is prone to bushfires, as well as to floods. Uh, uh, Sydney Water Corporation is, as I mentioned, the largest utility, uh, water utility in Australia and covers uh, water services for the greater Sydney area, which is shown here in blue. Um, and it provides water, uh, wastewater and stormwater services. But the, the focus of growth is in this area, which I've shown in a red circle, which you see is now quite empty. This is the new metropolis for Western, of Western Sydney, which will also include the Western Sydney airport. Um, and this is the, the once in a lifetime opportunity for a greenfield site to be developed with, uh, with sustainable development principles. And this area from north to south is 80 kilometers and from east to west is about 30 kilometers. So very, very large area. Um, so here you see some of the major capital projects that are being handled by Sydney Water Corporation. They, include renewal for existing infrastructure in what you see here is a blue area, uh, but more importantly, uh, new infrastructure in this large yellow area to the west. And this uh, uh, greenfield site provides opportunities for water recycling, for reuse of organic waste and converting that to biomethane to power a circular economy, to use innovative technologies for the city of the future. Uh, we have uh, more than 100 projects of one, more than 100 million each and two projects exceeding 1 billion. Uh, one of these projects is a pipeline that goes north to south, um, which provides resilience from two separate water sources for the city in times of drought. And the other $1 billion project, which I will speak about, is about the recycling of resources, water and organic waste. Here we have the governance aspect that is driving these projects. I was a member of the board of Sydney Water and the board had a strategy, uh, a, a clear view for driving sustainable development. Uh, the organization is a signatory to the UN Global Compact for Sustainable Development. Uh, there's a commitment to using renewable energy as much as possible and a net zero target 
uh, with an aspiration to achieve that by 2030, uh, to develop climate independent water supplies because the city faces cycles of drought and floods uh, on a regular basis and has only one major source of, of water, uh, which is a large dam to the west of the city. Uh, the, there's also a commitment to innovation, use of data, capacity building, and of course, a strong institution uh, committed to ethics and anti-corruption, which aligns with goal 16. Uh, and all projects are mapped against the UN SDGs and are reported in the annual report. So here is uh, one of the accelerators that I'd like to speak about, and that's innovation. So in Western Sydney, uh, the new development provides an opportunity for innovative development of, of networks for water, water and wastewater, but also for stormwater management. This is a new area that uh, has been developed and stormwater management enables uh, capturing some 300 gigaliters per year of rainfall runoff, uh, which can be used for greening the city. If you recall, this part of the city has only 16% green canopy at the moment. So per, the, the design of permeable surfaces to capture rainwater and the planting of trees is, is a key goal. And innovative design that you can see here um, is now part of development controls. So any developer, whether residential, industrial, uh, or educational facilities must comply with these controls, which require the capture of rainfall and avoid its runoff for a cooler, greener city. Uh, interestingly, this does not involve any additional cost, um, but the economic, social, and economic uh, uh, and employment benefits are huge and, uh, and exceed $10 billion. And also, of course, provide a better quality of life uh, uh, and uh, you know, recreational areas for people who will now live in the Western part of the city. Uh, recycling and reuse of resources is again uh, very important. And uh, now wastewater recovery facilities, no longer called sewage treatment plants in every part of the city are being expanded to produce biomethane that is used not only for energy generation for the plant, but also injected into the gas grid, saving greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, Co-digestion of food waste is increasingly being used in all these plants, also to produce biogas uh, and, to and to charge a circular economy. The target is to reach net zero by 2040, if not, not sooner. As I mentioned, there's an advanced water recycling center to be built in the Western Parkland city, which is a $1.1 billion investment. And this will treat 100 million liters of wastewater daily by 2036, but it will also be a resource recovery hub for the city, capturing domestic and agricultural organic waste and converting it into biogas, and also recycling water for, for reuse within the Western Parkland city by industry in particular. Uh, it's going to be a 10 minute drive from the new international airport and will activate a broader circular economy, uh, being the heart of a truly smart and circular city. Data and innovation, of course, is another accelerator that has been mentioned to advance SDG 6. And here you see two examples of how data is being used. On the left-hand side, you see a graph of the pipe networks and the over 6,000 IoT, Internet of Things devices that have been installed in manholes to monitor the water levels there and to provide predictive, proactive uh, alarms if there is a blockage when the water level changes. This has prevented uh, 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 breakages and uh, which are unwanted and which res usually result in discharges to the environment. And so it, it protects the environment, but also maintains services 
this kind of data and, and analytics is also used for predictive maintenance based on the uh, material of construction of pipes, soil types, age of pipes, size of pipes, and history of breakages. So again, predictive um, maintenance uh, is far more cost effective, of course, and again, prevents environmental discharges and surges. And on the right-hand side, you see a robot that has been developed in collaboration with university researchers in Sydney, to, which is used to inspect large mains, especially those that are hard to access. And uh, this not only provides accurate data, but also uh, helps to provide a safe working environment for employees. Capacity building is another accelerator that has been mentioned. And here, uh, of course, engineer, uh, in, um, uh, education and training is essential for all staff. Yeah, there's also a commitment in the organization for a diverse and inclusive workforce to increase the number of women, uh, but also to have an ethnically diverse workforce and incorporate employment opportunities for Australia's First Nations people who are the traditional owners of the land and waters where Sydney Water operates. We are engaging with uh, residential customers with what's called behind the meter technologies where customers can monitor and manage their own water use, creating more efficient, uh, more efficiencies and conservation. So you see here two examples. We're also trialing uh, uh, in situ, so in-house, uh, in residence, treatment of uh, grey water and recycling, say for gardens, uh, toilet flushing, and so on. Uh, the modelling of these benefits uh, is also important using government data on population growth, economic factors, and so on. And the benefits to cost ratio uh, is, is significant and is, is greater, it's tending towards a factor of two to three, that is two to three dollars of benefits for every dollar of investment. And finally, I want to talk about financing, uh, which is another accelerator for SDG six. Um, uh, the state government of New South Wales has brought in a sustainable bonds program where organizations that are committed to sustainability can borrow at lower costs if, uh, they're based on sustainable development targets that they identify. And you see here four projects that have been funded by the Sustainable Bonds Program, where the interest rate is reduced a couple of points um, when these targets for sustainable development are met, uh, and conversely uh, increased, of course, if they're not met. And here is an example of a project that has been funded through this program uh, this was a concrete drain, uh, which you can see has been rejuvenated. It's right in the heart of the harbor city, the older part of the city. And you can see it's been transformed into a beautiful recreational area um, and also attracts birds and wildlife and, and, a, and a wonderful pocket park uh, that serves the people of the city. And finally, reporting on progress. As I mentioned, cities are key. Um, um, uh, to driving sustainable development. And every single uh, of the, one of the SDGs are advanced when, when cities um, and their institutions and utilities get uh, committed to sustainable development. So I hope that my presentation provides that roadmap on how uh, the sustainable development targets can actually be delivered on the ground and to benefit people. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Marlene, uh, for your comprehensive uh, um, uh, description of this very big and very interesting project of uh, Sydney and uh, the extension of this uh, system. Thank you very much. I will give the floor to Dr. Tom uh, So that is the executive director of the International Association for Hydro Environment Engineering and Research. Please, Dr. Tom, the floor is yours. Thank you, Professor Vieira. 
Just checking that uh, everyone can hear me and see my slides. It's okay. Okay, so thank you for inviting uh, IHR to, to speak uh, today. I'll focus my presentation on the UN Sustainable Development Goals because we're here today in New York. Uh, I'm actually sitting in the same room as some of my colleagues here in the New York building. Uh, in On the occasion of the 2023 UN Conference on Water, which is actually the first time in almost 50 years that the UN has convened its member states uh, on the subject of water, so very important occasion. So without further ado, I'll continue my presentation. And what I'd like to start with is to start with a, what is hydroenvironment engineering, right? And I wanted to highlight that hydroenvironment engineering research is all about expanding our knowledge about water flows and the management of our engineered structures, not just the engineered structures, but the natural water bodies and the use and application of that knowledge to serve the needs of people in harmony with the environment. Now, how do we go about doing that and what is IHR? Let me give you a small introduction to IHR. We're a global network consisting of more than 5,000 members all around the world, regional divisions in Asia Pacific, Latin America, Europe, Africa, and the MENA regions, as well as North, North America. We bring together the thought leaders and experts as, uh, from various different technical communities, focusing on subjects such as digital water futures, hydraulics for sustainable development, climate change, adaptation and mitigation, as well as engineering solutions, blue-green engineering solutions that are in harmony with nature. There are some 30 or so technical committees and working groups that uh, form an essential part of our community. Our vision is to bring together the world's engineers, experts, researchers, and organizations to accelerate solutions and knowledge discovery about the water environment. Now, coming back to the SDGs, it's enough about IHR for now. They were instigated in 2015 after the Millennium Development Goals, and we're actually halfway through at the moment, with the horizon being 2030. So where are we now? where we're at. Uh, the, the news that you probably already know is that we're way off track and we need to progress four times faster in order to be able to hit those goals. Here you'll see, I've, I've given some graphics of reports on where how we're going. In the top right, you'll see a report from 2022, UN DESA put this out, showing that of the SDG six, the goals on water, none of them have been achieved and of the progress that's being undertaken, it's either not moving at all or quite weak. In the bottom right-hand graph or table, you'll see lots of red squares. I'm not asking you to read the figures, but all the red squares means ministers and directors of national water agencies of 88 countries from around the world representing 6 billion of the world's population think that these SDGs are either impossible or really quite challenging to achieve. It's a report run by the Water Policy Group in 2021. So what are we doing? What are we doing to try and accelerate to achieve this? I'm not going to go into this slide too much because my good colleague Ignacio already uh, mentioned the accelerator framework. And the one of the main objectives of this week in New York is to uh, invite everybody, all governments, all stakeholders and, and, and individuals to contribute to the global action agenda around these five accelerators and these five uh, interactive dialogues. Now, if we're going to do it and, and accelerate, we need to be sure that we're addressing the greatest risks and the greatest challenges. So here's a couple of uh, statistics from a report that was run specifically for this conference. Uh, that was supported by the Office of the President of the General Assembly that again went out to survey the ministers and national water leaders of all countries around the member states. And so 
92 countries responded, representing almost 6 billion of the population. And the top, top leaders of these countries cited as the greatest risks to their country, into their portfolio as the leaders of the water sector. Uh, and risks are def we defined as things outside of their control. Right? So things that kept them up at night outside of their control. There's clearly in runaway climate change and things related to climate change, such as floods and droughts. We also asked them what were the greatest challenges they faced. So these are things that are in, in their control, but they're really having a lot of difficulty doing. And I, I must admit, I was a little bit surprised to see these results, but the runaway solution was inadequate infrastructure, which would be a, a big note to, uh, to engineers around the world, but also inadequate use, uh, inadequate information and available uh, availability of data. Close to that, that second one would be fragmented water institutions. But anyway, so this gives us some context as engineers. These are the big, big challenges and the big, big risks that our water leaders around the world uh, are facing. So how do we go about doing it, you know, to, to address these? IHA would like to put forward that if we want successful engineering solutions or any solution, actually, we need to system-wide thinking. We need to ensure that we're looking at the whole of the water cycle. We're not working in our silos. There are many associations working on irrigation only, or on hydropower only, but we all need to work together across the whole cycle, from source to sea, from mountains to, to coasts. An example here I, I got on my screen is from uh, a project run by Arab uh, in response to disasters uh, in the late uh, 2010s, I think it was 2017 or 18, El Nino disaster in Peru. And it was not simply a flood protection um, project after a flood re recovery project. The engineering project in this sense covered education, it covered hospital rebuilding, it covered reforestation. It was a whole of system solution. This is the engineering of the future. I won't use this slide, obviously. I'll move quickly. Um, what is IHR doing about it? A couple of years ago, IHR uh, made a, a report on the role of engineers to achieve SDG 6. It highlights that the hydro environment community really has a lot of work to do in, in every single one of the SDG goals. I won't go into too much into this detail because again, Ignacio uh, went through this slide in, in his own presentation, but it was a product of uh, IHR in collaboration with many of our friends. And I would like to maybe uh, highlight some humble examples. I could say humble examples because there are so many examples of what our engineering community is doing to try to achieve and uh, and respond to these challenges that I, I noted a little bit earlier. We have very uh, a lot of resources uh, that will explain further. So, and I, I put here on the screen, um, uh, you know, outputs of our, our technical communities that you can access at any time. And in particular, we've made a copy, uh, a publication called Hydrolink, which specifically focuses and was released for this conference on how the IHR hydro environment engineering community contributes to the goals. And I'm going to end by just citing three humble examples from uh, our communities. One is from our hydraulic structures community and how the hydraulic structures in the 21st century are really at the heart of global sustainable development. It's essential because it's necessary to ensure continuous water supply, waste removal, energy, food security, amongst many other benefits to society. And to address these challenges, uh, concrete is a, action is required in the adaptation, mitigation and, and resilience areas. And our technical communities have identified six areas. I've been rushed here, so I'm not going to go into and cite all of them, but you can read them. Six key areas uh, of hydraulic structures uh, to, to address the SDGs. Another humble example that I'd like to put forward is from our hydroinformatics and digital waters community. So with the explosion of uh, data and accelerating computer power, we're really in unprecedented times now to be able to uh, analyze and respond to our water challenges. 
And I'll give a couple of small examples. In Singapore, some of our uh, members and partners have been working together to install radars and deep learning models that allow unprecedented, unprecedented abilities to predict rainfall to within 100 by 100 square meter uh, resolution. It's quite amazing if you've been to Singapore lately. And then of course, the other point I'd like to make here before going to my final slides is there's much opportunity in opportunistic sensing at, via CCTV cameras that are already installed. How do we analyze that data? Social media, because many people capture incredible amounts of data on these kinds of platforms and how we're able to use those, that uh, to accelerate our management in the future. And the last humble example I'd like, I'd like to talk about is just climate change adaptation and mitigation. Here is uh, an example from our eco-hydraulics community. So for those of you who are unfamiliar with that, the eco-hydraulics is looking at the interface between abiotic and biotic uh, relationships, especially for us in the, uh, in the uh, water um, aquatic um, environments. And their key focus areas of innovation at the moment are looking at things such as remote sensing and, and, and the coupling with the modeling to allow them to better understand temperature changes sediment changes and these kinds of things to better be able to manage um, uh, eco-hydraulics in their fields. There are so many more examples I could talk about. Net zero is one of my pet topics, but I don't think I have time to talk about it. I think some of my other colleagues did. I'd like to just end then by showing this graph, OECD innovations that, that track the explosion of innovation over the last decade or so to, to follow um, uh, uh, some of the co my, my previous colleagues, and that IHR will be hosting its next Congress in Vienna in late August, which we would very much invite you and our friends at the WFEO to mutually uh, explore uh, further cooperation. And on this final slide, just to highlight the key people uh, from our own association, which looks at the, the collaborations between the SDGs and the hydro environment engineering and research community. So you're more than welcome to join us uh, and discuss further with all of our experts. Thank you very much. All right. Okay. Uh, Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Uh, Tom, so for your inspiring uh, presentation and uh, also uh, thank you for your invitation to come to Vienna, to your Congress. Now I will give the floor to um, Mrs. Shreya Chakraborty, that is a researcher on the International Water Management Institute, New Delhi, uh, India. Please, uh, Shreya, the floor is yours. Thank you. Okay, so again, good afternoon, good evening, good morning, and good midnight to whoever is joining from my part of the world. Um, so thanks for having me on the panel. And I've, I think, heard some really sophisticated presentations uh, today about so many roles that technology uh, and engineering solutions have to play with SDG 6. But the only social scientist and human geographer on this panel and generally the social sciences have tended to hold a challenging intersection you know uh, interdisciplinarity with engineering i'm going to bring the whole discussion back to very very simple basics and uh, probably things that you've already heard about but try and see if you can understand this that how some of these things have continued to uh, you know despite all of the sophisticated technology and solutions that have come up in the global north and in the global south that's not always necessarily true i'm just going to go into some very conceptual identification and just bring all engineers and technology science and technology community to go back into a little bit of introspection and try to understand why despite so many decades and decades of technological solutions we have not exactly you know overcome a lot of the social uh concerns around it so my idea was to Firstly, push for thinking uh, and locating technology within a socio-ecological framework, 
uh, or systems thinking. Tom already mentioned how we look at uh, the water systems as a as a totality, but I would also talk about you know socio-ecological interconnectedness, the fact that you cannot affect one without affecting the other. So it seems almost counterintuitive to me that, that the social gets missed out so often when we talk of technology. And because technology plays this role of mediating this relationship between the, between the ecology and the social, uh, whether it's through sustainability and the human rights paradigm that we've now come into uh, over years of community mobilization, you know, uh, against technological solutions, especially large infrastructure solutions. Um, and I think in the beginning, we already heard how we had sort of started to question what technology could look like in a new, uh, more human rights paradigm and answering SDG goals um, is to ask ourselves that how important technology is that by, re, you know, so historically society has always been configured around water access and availability and technology by reconfiguring ecology is, has got the power to restructure society entirely, you know, from its systems, resource ownership, how, you know, society is structured in terms of its power relations it's everyday practices. So the first thing that I would ask, you know, in terms of where engineering solutions can go in the future is to turn inwards um, as a community and ask, firstly, are we aware of this power that technology and our solutions and our science holds? Are we sensitive to it? And are we responsible and responsive to it? So when we go into extremely sophisticated methodologies, we almost get involved in that without really trying to look beyond it. Um, and this is sort of a with great power comes great responsibility argument and to try and introspect into that. So what we have is that, um, you know, we sort of tried to, you know, over these last many decades of, um, uh, you know, community mobilization against large infrastructure like dams and everything. And we started to question a lot of engineering solutions and almost started to question what is the relevance of it for the future. And we thought that there were new ideas that had come around demand management, there were soft skills services that had come in. And yet in the last few years in the Global South and South Asia, we find that there is, we are reverting to these large infrastructural solutions and yet Paradoxically, we are actually reverting to these last uh, these large infrastructure solutions using the human rights argument, using the human rights paradigm, instead of so we now we I mean what I've shown here is essentially this massive drinking water project that has come up across an entire state uh, in India, and even though all of this infrastructure is being built for storing water essentially for you know reasons, and it's only twenty percent that is being going to be taken out for drinking water. But that is the main argument through which, so human rights paradigms now have been completely turned and you know we haven't gone back to answering all the, all the questions why the human rights paradigm had come in. And we are, we've come back to reverting to these large uh, technical solutions. So it's not that um, these solutions have gone away, but rather can we rethink about them? So there is a lot of political economy, which is there supporting these large infrastructure and engineering solutions in the global south. Um, you know, there's enormous amount of investments which go behind it. There's enormous scale in the, which allows for a lot more power and centralization and government involvement right from top, lesser and lesser decentralization in terms of uh, ownership of these uh, of, of resource and of technology on the ground. And these, these are sort of engineering provides short term tangible outputs for governments, right, because they are there in power for four or five years and they really have to show outputs. So there is a political economy that continues to push for large engineering solutions. But we also need to ask ourselves that have we then overcome the problems why we had started the battles in the first place? Or have we just gone back to doing the same things again? So it's very important that as the science and technology community, we start understanding the social of technology and ask about these categories of political access, economic access, and social access. You know, who gets to access technology? Is it meant and designed for everyone? 
but that's not enough. It's not enough to just say someone, some people do and others can't, but also ask about the questions on why they can't. And that's where these processes come in, which is socioeconomic, sociopolitics and political economy, which actively tend to um, consolidate power in the hands of some to own resource and therefore use technology to appropriate resource over others. And this is a con and this is a, a political process that essentially goes into excluding certain people. It's not about people who get missed out, but rather to identify the reasons why people get missed out because there are political processes which are involved in using technology by a few people being able to access technology only by a few people to then own resources and then restructure and consolidate power within certain communities. And as a reason, um, what I'm going to sort of pitching for is that is there is it now a time to not to shift even beyond the human rights paradigm to start thinking about justice? And this is a very interesting, important concept, I think, that could really affect the way engineering and um, the science and technology community looks in, you know, within themselves in terms of what role do they play with regard to environmental climate justice. So human rights has a connotation which is a, ben a, a benevolent, you know, universality. We talk about people, we talk about communities, we very rarely talk about who in the community and who amongst the people, because they're all, you know, we talk about resource for all, but all are not same. So when the level playing fields were never there to start with, then equal solutions for everyone, no matter how benevolent they are and how for everyone they're designed, they do not reach everyone. And can engineers then be a part of firstly understanding that the justice concept against the human rights concept actually has power structures that tend to co-opt solutions and the solutions, the technological solutions that are provided by us in technology, they get co-opted by some to continue and even consolidate power over their resources and keep others away. So even when with the best kinds of governance, with the best meaning scenarios where we try to say drinking water for all, we continue to see in villages that the richer households have got, you know, motors and they've got this entire informal basket of economy, uh, of technology, of technology, which they have used to further appropriate even this water for all and make sure that they have 24 hour supply, whereas people downstream simply do not. So Unless we come down to understanding justice and the fact that our technology is not reaching some, not just because there are governance gaps, and it's not just because, um, you know, we don't have enough finances, but the fact that even with all of it, without the correct um, configuration and without the correct design, without the current in intent of technology, those injustices can get replicated and technology becomes a tool in the hands of injustice to then further reproduce themselves. And therefore, my call is here is that can science and technology start to think beyond a human rights perspective into a justice perspective? Um, so in terms of, I mean, th these are just examples that I've, you know, come up from my own uh, field level work as a civil society organization earlier. And now at Amy also, we have a lot of ground level work is to identify what kind of responsive pathways can we come out when we talk about inclusive, right? We just talk that it's for everyone. We love using the words of gender and equity, but when you go to the ground, that really means something. It's not a word, it's not just a goal. It really means in everyday life and everyday practice. And there's a whole pathway in which equity is, you know, inequity is practiced on a daily basis and can we break that? So inclusive knowledge, for instance, is not just, so of course, there is the whole idea of gender in STEM, which has really grown having more women, but also understanding that we don't, so women are not a homogenous group, there are intersectionalities, that women from all sections of society do not respond to technology in the same way, do not come from the similar lenses, do not come from the same problem spaces, and therefore do not also provide the same solution spaces. And therefore to start thinking in terms of intersectional marginalities, uh, which is how we end up nuancing our understanding of the justice concept. Other thing that in terms of inclusive knowledge or interdisciplinarity, I was running a uh, a, a four-year project in South Asia, which actually went into teaching interdisciplinary methodology to water engineers. And we thought that it was so intuitive that you could just go and teach social methods. And it just did not work because we realized that disciplinary boundaries are so entrenched 
in our sciences that interdisciplinarity is more than just having three scientists from different fields working on a project. It actively talks about breaking boundaries, hierarchies, and disciplinary arrogance, which puts some sciences and some methods and considers some disciplines to be more scientific than others and therefore not worth engaging with. Um, how do we break those boundaries? The fact that value systems and axioms of individual disciplines have to be, for, you know, have to be questioned and have to be crossed. And this can be build a conversation. Plural knowledge is, and for the Global South, this is such an important way to decolonize our engineering, is that can we not just work in our labs, can we go down to the fields and really talk to traditional knowledge, to resource cultures on the ground? Because there is so much grassroots innovation, there is so much traditional knowledge, which works with local materials, which works with local geographical contexts and local resource contexts, local religious contexts. And all of these technologies you find in formality rampant in the global south have come out of these daily practices around technology. So can engineering really engage with that? And as a direct next step would be inclusive design. You know, So I think we had already discussed appropriate scale where you, the larger your scales, the more governance implications towards centralization can be find decentralized solutions, locally relevant solutions. Uh, can we be sensitive to local practices, resources and capacities and make sure that when we provide a solution, our, can people on ground really access it on a daily basis, operate it, maintain it? And as a result, what we could consider is thinking of basket of technologies rather than singular technological solutions and offer a large variety of solutions to every community so that the communities themselves can work with those and choose the kind of technologies that suit their scales, that suit their communities, and can they then modify these technologies. And we really need to talk about intellectual property rights, patents, as much as these are great outputs for our projects, for our work, sometimes they can actually hinder people from, you know, modifying technologies or from accessing them. So again, design for uncertainty and resilience. Can we think of design as something that's flexible for the future and still make it affordable? And finally, to talk about inclusive governance, which is engineering as a part of governance, just engage with policy and the governance process. We have engineers who are part of governments, departments, ministries. This everyday participatory design, citizen science, this engagement with policy is very important for those who design technology because it is a direct way in which society can be communicated with and social norms and social inequalities can really be understood on a daily basis. Engaging with everyday resource governance and informality in the global south is really important for engineers to stop, you know, to think beyond very sophisticated knowledge, but rather actually break it down and see what everyday resource governance and informality looks like. Because in India, for instance, informality, there's literally grassroots innovations coming from just plugging in gaps where technology is simply not available through formal scales. And finally, Assessments of co-benefits and trade-offs can some is something that can really offer engineering solutions a more social lens is when we start thinking of externalities. Can we go into the design already thinking of externalities and potential externalities rather than just being obsessed with the design and then later on saying, well, let's do the governance right and it'll work out. If we start thinking of trade-offs and externalities right at the design level, then we can take it into governance with a much more sensitive way of engaging with the social of technology. So these are my three basic takeaways, you know, really bringing it back to the basics after those wonderful, tech, uh, wonderful presentations is, can we think about technology in the socio-ecological interconnectedness? Because then we would never stop thinking about the social and the ecological. Why make it an option to not think about it? Why, why be an afterthought? You know, why be something that you're pushed to think about? Um, can we be aware, sensitive and responsible to this power that technology holds to restructure society. Like just imagine the amount of responsibility on our heads that every time we produce a design, we are effectively changing the way a particular community is structured internally. It's a huge power. And to go beyond a human rights paradigm and start questioning, is there space for environmental and climate justice and can engineering really respond to the justice paradigm and start moving into that? Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Uh, Shriya, um, for your uh, 
socio-ecological point of view of this problem that is the access of water and the sanitation for people. Thank you very much. Now um, we are coming to the end of this uh, webinar. I must, um, uh, we have already exceeded our time. Uh, I must uh, thank uh, very much Dr. Ignacio Gonzalez, uh, Dr. Marlene Kanga, Dr. Tom Su, and uh, Dr. Shea Shakwarti for your uh, very interesting and very brilliant uh, presentations. Thank you very much. And uh, maybe we can see uh, you again in another webinar organized by uh, the WFU. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much.